next we have a crazy presentation on algorithm biases and how the racism before systemic racism has made its way down to modern day technology presented by the one the only she's class she's grace she's a badass ux designer on the central accessibility team at google please welcome my good college friend shabby kashani Hey everyone. Hey, Betsy. Hi. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I'm going of to my screen really quickly so we can get started. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, I'll just like lead you to a jump right in because I'm really, really excited for this presentation. So. All right. Can everyone see my screen? Yep. Right. So thank you so, so much to Mitzi and Garrett for organizing this event. Exactly. I am beyond honored to be a part of this sure? event. And thank you all. Um, it was so much. Because <laughs> I like. Who are watching. Uh, we, this wouldn't be a movement without your support. Um, so I'm Shabby, a UX designer on the central accessibility team at Google. However, I wanted to quickly disclaim that my thoughts captured here solely represent my own and not my employers. And I'd like to get started by sharing my story as a Puerto Rican Persian who grew up in the South on the East Coast. So for most of my life, my sense of identity was in question leading to microaggressions that are familiar to many black and brown people. Microaggressions occur when people lack awareness of how race affects their biases and the overall understanding of people of color. So growing up, people interrogated me about my nationality. Upon repeatedly stating I was American from Florida, People would insist on uncovering where my parents were from to perpetuate the perception of me as a foreigner, or they would simply generalize my ethnicity as Indian. This is a form of micro-invalidation. These generalizations continue to follow me into the digital space due to poor representation of black and brown people. With only a few image recognition data points, such as the vibrant pattern tapestries and the diverse races and hairstyles seen in these photos, the lack of systems diversity led to iOS photos wrongly identifying my location as Nari, Tibet, and China. No one, not even our intelligent algorithmic systems, ever gets my identity right. And I'd argue the US consensus doesn't even have an accurate representation of what it means to be Middle Eastern. Ironically, the US consensus classifies Middle Eastern as white. This dilutes Iranian culture and doesn't even reflect society's perception of whiteness. Yet Middle Eastern families are striving to achieve this sense of white American success. So my parents shielded me from my culture as a form of protection against bigotry and racism. I never learned Spanish or Farsi and therefore couldn't communicate with family members outside of my immediate household. My teachers would micro insult me, another form of microaggressions, by mispronouncing my name Shabnam, which is one of the most common Persian names. So I went by Shabby. Yet kids would quickly learn how to insult my name, calling me shabby not too shabby. They start insulting my appearance, hyper-focusing on my body hair. It was to a point where I wore a jacket every day to school just to avoid people from looking and touching my arms. Mind you, I was still growing up in Florida where summers were well above 100 degrees. And one day I told my teacher that I didn't want to go into class because I had forgotten my jacket. And rather than addressing the students who were discriminating against me, she took me to guidance counseling, still making me, the brown girl, the problem. So no matter how much my parents tried to protect me from discrimination, I was growing up in an era where racially profiling Middle Easterners was deemed as American due to the misrepresentation and Islamophobia that media proliferated. This led to micro assaults from my first grade peers where they alienated me and labeled me as a terrorist. 
Terrorists are seemingly always Muslim or Middle Eastern, but never white. Yet we've seen time and time again, there are mass shootings committed by white people, but we've never generalized the white communities as white nationalists or even criminals. This is what we can prescribe to as human bias. Bias is ingrained in our DNA and was, a, was crucial in human evolution. Tribal bias is a natural and honestly inevitable feature of human cognition that none of us are unfortunately immune to. Humans evolved in the context of intense intergroup competition where groups that were comprised of loyal members oftentimes succeeded more than those who were not. Therefore, selective pressures have consistently sculpted human minds to be tribal. Today, we'd attribute tribal mentality to affinity bias because we tend to get along with others who are just like us. Confirmation bias then reconfirms affinity bias because it provides us with evidence that supports what we already think. Then familiarity bias creates this positive feedback loop since we prefer familiar experiences with familiar people, which results in discriminating against human diversity simply because diversity is different and unfamiliar. And finally, default bias propels this system forward because we tend to not change in established behavior. And throughout epics, we've prejudged someone based on stereotypes created from our simplified assumptions of prior experiences and beliefs. The prejudice today take forms such as racism, sexism, homophobia, ableism, classism, religious prejudice, ageism, xenophobia, and many more. These ideologies and assumptions that target minorities have been held for centuries, but are now augmented and automated by algorithmic systems that transcend generations. So we're at an inflection point where we need to address our biases and how they enable externalities which preside proxies of whiteness while perpetuating systemic racism within black and brown communities. The technology we have mirrors the society we have and the way that power is distributed within that society. So those who have power and privilege get to decide which technologies get built and who they benefit. And through this pandemic and civil rights movement, we're realizing that the venture capitalist driven technology and tech for tech's sake seldom benefits people of color and rather exponentially harms them. As algorithms expand their ability to organize Oh, 2016 Google search results mm -hmm. and 2015 Google photos. Google is well aware that their algorithms surface existing biases due to the world's prejudice information. And they're actively working to resolve these biases. But we as creators have our own role in acknowledging and preventing our biases from morphing into unintended externalities. So when we go to design these modern day algorithmic solutions, we need to identify the building blocks of where our biases seep in. But first and foremost, you need to ask yourself and your team, what is the problem that you're trying to solve and why do you think it's a problem? You need to have a clear sense of which communities this technology will benefit and which it may harm. This can be accomplished through various empathy building tools and through user research. Conducting this investigation is crucial. And once you've answered this question, you can begin assessing the building blocks of your algorithm.
as designers, you don't need to know all the inner workings, minute details of an algorithm. It's enough to remember this fundamental framework of inputs, operations, and outputs. Inputs are the data we train the models on. Operations are what we do with that data and what we set as objectives. And outputs are the real world results and consequences that impact society and especially people of color. So let's take a look at real case studies where biases have impacted the algorithm and therefore harms people of color. Starting with the elephant in the room, predicting policing software. PredPol is one of the leading predictive policing softwares where their strategy involves cracking down on minor crimes with the goal of deterring more serious criminal activity. PredPol assigns probabilities to locations where it predicts the likelihood of crime by highlighting locations with the highest probabilities. The algorithm used data on public reported crime based on the site of police cars, regardless of what the police were doing. Therefore, the system misunderstood police car sightings when modeling its crime predictions. In turn, the system's recommendations led to assigning an increase of over patrolling communities of color that are already heavily monitored by police and other forms of surveillance. Many types of biases led to this feedback loop, such as the anchoring bias in the input, where designers relied heavily on the first piece of information and data that they saw. And in this case, were the police car sightings. Then expectation bias creeped into the algorithmic operations where designers were influenced by their expectations of police presence being the cure to crime. And finally, default bias in the output of the system perpetuated the status quo in marginalized Black communities by reinforcing the default racist criminal justice system. And to some people, this could result in a horns effect and a confirmation bias where a racist person's impression of a Black person is influenced by their existing assumptions and stereotypes that Black people are criminals. From this example alone, you may, begin, you may begin to notice that biases impact how society shapes itself around the data and information that algorithms leverage. So in this case, if data shows a high number of arrests in a particular area, an algorithm may assign more police patrols in that area, which could lead to more arrests. Another critical aspect of our society is access to healthcare and medical treatments. The US healthcare system employs commercial algorithms to guide healthcare decisions which impact many millions of people. However, these algorithms, with no surprise, also exhibit significant racial bias. First, they operate under the assumption that has been long lived since slavery, that black people have a higher pain tolerance. And secondly, the system fails to consider the racial wealth gap. The algorithm associates amounts spent on healthcare to the amount of care needed. Since black people have historically spent less than white people on healthcare, the algorithm made its own conclusion that black people don't need as much money and care to reach the same level of health as white people. This is an example of a machine learning algorithm where the system is making its own operations which obscures its decision-making process to its creator. However, if we take a closer look, we could potentially tie its conclusion to something called a confounding variable, where the system made an assumption that the amount one spends is a direct correlation to the status of their health. When in reality, the spurious association was excluding a key variable, the patient's socioeconomic status. So when black people can't pay for their healthcare 
the system assumes that they don't need to because they're already healthy enough. While white people have historically spent more on healthcare because they have more money, so the algorithm assumes that they need more care and therefore prioritizes their needs, not realizing the socioeconomic inequities and systemic racism. Now, this isn't the system's fault. It's the designers, creators, and technologists. The racial bias by design could have been due to attentional bias during the input stage, where designers filtered out the fact that there's an exponential wealth gap between black and white communities and solely paid attention to the dollar amount data spent on healthcare. Next, the operation parameters employed selection bias because it measured a population's health based on their spending rather than the population's ailments, leading to underrepresentation of black communities overall health. And finally, authority bias influenced a faulty output where doctors attributed more importance to the opinion of an algorithmic system than the symptoms of black patients, resulting in unequal healthcare treatments. These racially biased algorithms are especially dangerous to those who are intersectionally marginalized, such as black women and black people with a wide range of abilities. Classifications such as gender and disability are extremely sensitive data for intersectional people. So this information is oftentimes concealed and in many cases, it's even illegal to ask. So when a system doesn't have data on certain individuals, it makes assumptions about what could be based on patterns and correlations of what is deemed as the average person. This is called an imputation. The problem with imputations is that there's no such thing as an average person. And oftentimes trans women and people with disabilities aren't even represented in the data set or may be overlooked as outliers if they're in the data set. The TSA algorithm discriminates against those who don't fit the binary confines of gender because it forces a TSA agent to select male or female before scanning the person. The system flags potential threats when it encounters what it has learned as an anomaly. Since the model was trained on binary people, trans men and women are oftentimes victim to automated sexism, resulting in invasive and unwarranted TSA pat-downs. A TSA agent may press the button that corresponds with the perception of the passenger's sex. But the passenger's gender presentation may mean using a chest binder, a packer, or a breast shaper, which the machine then marks as inconsistent with its expected algorithm for the passenger's sex, thus triggering an alarm. So using the same framework, we can address the design biases in the TSA algorithms. The data input reflected the creator's expectation bias of gender being a binary trait. This forced TSA agents to perpetuate this ideology. Attentional bias informed the system's prejudice operations because the designers failed to represent and think about the risk that this system would impose on trans communities. And instead, the system filters its data set to either male or female and only pays attention to abnormalities that deviate from what it deems as gender norms. And finally, the output can be attributed to authority bias, where the system flags an error and the TSA agent must pat down the passenger before proceeding. All three of these case studies that I've addressed today are up and running in our American governmental systems due to venture capital. Yet our lawmakers fail to understand that machine learning algorithms learn from historically biased patterns and correlations, and oftentimes only optimize for something that is not the well-being of people who are affected by 
these decisions. This impact needs to be much more prominent in the design process to prevent technology from automating injustices. We need to be hyper aware of our biases and actively include diverse people in our companies and our data sets. Then we need to find novel ways of measuring systems that assess the design impact on the end user, especially those in disadvantaged groups. So until we stop framing black and brown people as the problem and only prioritizing capitalist America, we're not employing human-centered algorithmic design. Thank you. Please, please, please keep following and engaging with Where are the Black Designers so we can continue this conversation around inclusive algorithms and products. This is a movement, not a moment. Yeah, that was an incredible presentation. And I really loved how you showcase a lot of case studies of technology that are basically using these racist algorithms to serve and protect our communities. And we really need to work to dismantle that in order to create safer communities to live in and, and for Black people to be themselves. So with that being said, I have a question for you. Um, what would you say to tech companies on how we need to stop this issue, essentially? Well, I think first we need to understand uh, the decision makers in society are dictating what designers create and the decision makers are people with privilege. And also that these algorithms are a source of authority, but not realizing that the biases are baked into these systems. So we need to stop uh, prioritizing the opinion of an algorithm and make sure we're talking to people mm -hmm. and ensure that the algorithms aren't facilitating the goals and success of white people and unknowingly sowing deeper inequities for black and brown people. So we need to stop conflating social problems with black and brown people and overall practice more inclusive design at every stage of the creative process. Right. Um, I think those are ama amazing demands. I would, I'm hoping that companies are out here hearing that because I would really love to see that happen. But thank you so much, Shavi. I love you so much. I'm so proud of you for doing this. Um, but thank you for your time. Thank you. Of course. Thanks everyone for tuning in.